Okay, let's continue to go through Psalm 119. We, we did the section. This is the first time that I've done Psalm 119 back to back. Usually I, I, uh, I give a little break in between. Go back to Matthew. But I uh, wanted to move through Psalm 119 last night. Last night I taught this one. I didn't teach the one that I taught yesterday morning. Um, but let's go ahead and start Psalm 119 again being the longest chapter in the book. It's called the Golden Alphabet because it has 22 sections corresponding with the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Each section, uh, the verses in each of the sections start with the letter um, of that Hebrew alphabet. So today we're looking at uh, Samek and Ayin. I mean, each of these verses then in Hebrew, 113 through 120, start with that Hebrew letter, Samek. Let's read that one first. The Holy Spirit through the psalmist writes, I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise, that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. So let's just read that one. We'll talk through Samek, and then we'll go to the next one. Uh, right off the rip, verse 113. He, King James has this translated from the original text. I hate vain thoughts is what the King James has. The ESV, NIV, New King James has a little bit different. Um, the ESV says, I hate the double-minded. So look at the difference between these two. I hate the double-minded. I hate vain thoughts. So there's a little bit of a confusion then. Who is he talking about? Is he talking about himself? Is he talking about his own vain thoughts? Or is he talking about someone else's? I think the ESV does a, does a better job with its translation to help kind of provide the answer to that question. I hate the double-minded. Right? The double-minded. And if you look at the context of this, you'll notice he's not talking about himself because in verse... 115, he, he refers to evildoers. He says, depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Verse 118, talking to the Lord, you spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. So clearly he has in his mind the persecutors that are persecuting him, right? So that's who he's talking about. So I like the ESV here a little bit better because it, it, it communicates... Um, I hate the double-minded verses. I hate vain thoughts. Both are true. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that it, it's, a, it's more in line with the context of the rest of the section. Um, clearly showing us that he's talking about the double-minded. And like I said, both are true. Because earlier on in the psalm, um, in, in verse 59, he says, When I think on my ways, I turn my feet to your testimonies. So the psalmist here doesn't think he's perfect. He's sinless. He knows he's not. He says, When I think on my ways... My ways are wretched. I'm a knucklehead. I turn to your testimonies. Then he says, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. <coughs> so he's talking about he hates the double-minded. And that's the individual who has one foot in the kingdom. Well, in reality, not even. One foot at the edge of the kingdom, right? And one foot in the world. Um, speaking out of both sides of the mouth. Speak Jesus when it's beneficial to Jesus. Speak the world when it's beneficial to speak the world. We see this even in this room um, with some of our academy guys over the years. Um, Jesus, 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 right? And then they're out on the, on the rock smoking a cigarette and swearing like a sailor, right? Talking and then glorifying those Days when they were walking in darkness, right? The double-minded, speaking out of both sides of the mouth. Now, someone, and I've even heard this, people justify this double-mindedness, and they use Scripture to do it. They say, well, Paul became all things to all people, so that's why I'm just kind of, I'm, yeah, but Paul doesn't say that it's okay to live in that darkness, an ongoing habitual life of rejecting God and walking in the ways of the world. 
So they're taking the scripture and twisting it to communicate their, what they want to teach and what they want to communicate. The psalmist here hates the double-minded, right? Hates the double-minded, but loves the Lord's law. Look at 114, and we're going to look at 117. He says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word, hold me up that I may, the verse 117, hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. Do you guys ever see the movie Twister? Right? My favorite part of that movie is the cow. There's just something about seeing a cow flying through the air like sideways like that, you know? I just love that movie. When the storm comes, right, this big tornado comes, um, Helen Hunt and uh, I think it's John Paxson, right? Um, they run into this, what? Bill Paxson, that's right. John Paxson was a basketball player for the Bulls. Bill Paxson. Um, Bill Paxson and Helen Hunt. When the storm comes, they run to this rickety old shed, right? They hold on to the pipe, right? And the storm just demolishes the shed, right? So the psalmist here is saying that he's not running to the shed. What's the shed? Well, the shed is the things of the world, provide us comfort, right? Fleeting comfort, or even my own works, because there's two things going on here. He's saying, you are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word, hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. He's saying, clearly, Lord, you are the one that I run to. I'm not running to the rickety shed of my own efforts, my own abilities, or the things of the world. The storm's going to demolish it. I'm running to you and your word. Amen? So, John, I mean, John 16, 6, 16, 33 says, In me, Jesus is saying, in me, you have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. In me, you'll have peace. In the world, you have tribulation. That's what the psalmist gets it. He knows this is the, the reality of the psalmist's heart here. In Christ, peace, in the world, tribulation. Christ says, But take heart, I have overcome the world. If we're in we're, if, if we're in Christ, we're in Christ. So the peace that he's talking about here, it's Jesus, in me you have peace. Pay attention to this. We have peace in two different regards, the here and now. Okay, the psalm says, you are my hiding place, the here and the now, in the midst of the difficult storms, in the midst of the fiery darts, you are my hiding place. I am in you. Amen. But ultimately, in the midst of the most horrific storm that will ever come upon humanity, the wrath of God being poured out on humanity, significantly more horrific than any of the storms that we run to Christ when we're in the midst of. But in the, in, in the reality of that wrath being poured out, we are found to be in Christ. Amen? Not the rickety shed of rickety, torn apart, straw house of our own efforts when we stand before God, but in His efforts because we're found in Him. And that's what the psalmist holds his hope in. Because it, that ultimate judgment, right? The ultimate wrath, that judgment, is clearly on the psalmist's mind because look at verse 119 and 120. Because the psalmist is in the midst of persecution. We've read this throughout the, the text, right? He's in the middle of persecution. But here in 119 and 120, he is thinking about judgment. He looks, he says, All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross, therefore I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I'm afraid of your judgments. The ultimate judgment, of course, being final judgment. What's dross? Because he says, All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. It's beautiful. I think Doc taught me this. I didn't know what it was. Maybe it was Doug. When a refiner is refining metal, he cranks the heat up, melts it down. The dross is all the impurities, all the garbage, the dirt that rise to the top. The refined pure metal is in the bottom. All the dirt and the impurities is called dross. The refiner will scoop the dross out of the, the surface and then pitch it. And then what's left? The refined metal. 
psalmist is saying, you're going to do that, Lord, with the wicked. That nasty, dirty impurities that rise to the surface with the metal is just scooped up and then pitched away. That's what's going to happen with the wicked, is what he's saying. The psalmist, however, is not in the dross. He's the metal, the purified metal. Amen? You know how you know that? He loves the, t the, he loves the Lord's testimonies and he fears the Lord and His judgment. The dross, the wicked, don't love the Lord's testimonies and don't fear His judgment. Not at all. So we see then in verses 113 to 120, God's Word opposes the wicked. I hate the double-minded. That the, the, the wicked will be discarded like dross. Now in 121 through 128, we see God's Word creates God godliness in the believer, in the psalmist. And we're going to see this in four ways. We're going to see God, this, the Word of God creating, manifesting godliness in the, in the psalmist four ways. Faith in the promises of God. We see it, hope in the future of salvation. Godliness is manifesting itself, coming to the surface, that we can see in the psalmist four ways. Faith in the promises of God, hope in a future salvation, a teachable spirit, and hatred of the ungodly way of life. Let's look at these verses and kind of walk through that. 121, Nora, pay attention to this. Because this is the verse that the Lord had me in yesterday, right after we received that letter. I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Man. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act, for your law has been broken. Therefore, I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false ray. Psalmist here proclaims that he has done what is just and right. His conscience is clear. That's a beautiful thing to have. He proclaims, I have done what is just and right. So primarily and ultimately, it is the gospel. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And then even after that, then obedience, walking in the way of the Lord. Um, walking in a way that is upright, that is above reproach. And that is what he, he's able to say, I've done what is right, just and right. He's lived accordance with God's expectations. Not perfect, not perfect. But he's lived in accordance with that and has been obedient. He says, I've, 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 I've done what's right and just. So we see godliness manifesting itself in four ways. The Word of God creates godliness. How do we know that the Word of God has created godliness in this psalmist? Who is possibly David. How do we know? Well, the first way we see this is that this godliness appears to us that the psalmist has faith in the promises of God. Verse 122, he says, Give your servant a pledge of good. Let not the insolent oppress me. He wants a pledge from the Lord. He wants the Lord to give him a pledge, to give him his word. And he, tr he wouldn't ask for it if he didn't trust it. Amen? So he trusts in the promises of God. And then he says in verse 124, Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love. He desires for the Lord to pronounce a pledge of good upon him. The psalmist cries, pledge thyself to me that you will keep me. He says, remember your promises. He knows he will. He's faithful. The Lord is faithful. In the midst of the storm, we know he's faithful. And we can say, I've done what is just and right. Beautiful. The second way that we see godliness manifesting itself in the psalmist. I know that the psalmist is walking in godliness because he has a hope in a future salvation. Verse 123. 
My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Two salvations, eternal salvation also, but salvation from oppressors, salvation from persecutors. My eyes long for salvation. Now in this one, I like the King James translation better. Has anybody got a King James? King James? Got King James 123, can you read that? You don't have, do you have King James? Go ahead and read it. My eyes long for your salvation. Because the King James translation kind of gives a description of the kind of longing that the psalmist is engaged in. It's beautiful. 123. Mine eyes fail for thy salvation and for the, and for the word of thy righteousness. My eyes fail. Like he's longing for the salvation so much that with such intensity that his eyes are beginning to fail. They're weakening because he's longing for that. Isn't that a beautiful picture? That he longs for that salvation with such intensity that his eyes are getting weak and beginning to fail. Waiting and looking so intently for the Lord's salvation from the psalmist oppressors. Seems like he's in desperation mode as he longs for salvation. My eyes long for your salvation and fulfillment of your righteousness. How are we to respond when we are in this season? When we're in the season of, of, of being persecuted and we're longing, we're, we're longing for relief of salvation from immediate persecution. How are we to respond in that? To long for His salvation, right? Hebrews 10, 37, 38 says, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. In the midst of persecution, he's longing for that salvation. He's not, he's not retracting. He's not shrinking back, the psalmist. He's longing and desiring for that so much that his, King James says his eyes fail. Third way we see godliness manifested in the psalmist. It's, it's here. What does it look like? How do we know? It's teachable spirit. Look at 124, the second part of 124. And teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. The more a servant knows about his master, the more a servant knows about his master, the more he trusts his master. So he's longing for understanding. Give me knowledge. Give me understanding. Why? What's the, the, the end game isn't to just gain knowledge. The end game is to have knowledge so I understand my master better. Therefore, I trust him more. No matter the difficult storms, I trust him in the midst of it, Justin. No matter how difficult it is, give me understanding. And after this, the, the byproduct of this is understanding as I trust the master so that when I'm in the difficult storm, He's got it. He's got a plan. He's good. He's faithful. All things work together for good for those who love God, called according to His purpose. I know that's me. I know I'm not like I used to be. You've done something to me. I love you. I know you've called me according to your purpose. So I'm just going to wait to see how this thing shakes out. And if I get to see it on this side of heaven, fantastic. And I know I'll see it on the next side when I get there with you. No question about it. But He's teachable. Godliness creates, manifests itself with a teachable spirit. And then the last one, a hatred of the ungodly way of life. Godliness, the Word of God creates godliness and it manifests itself in a hatred for the ungodly way of life. 126, it is time for the Lord to act for your law has been broken. Therefore I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold, Therefore, I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Love-hate relationship going on in the psalmist's heart. Loves the word, hates the false ways. Hates. Hates. That's a strong word. 
the byproduct of the word is godliness, which manifests itself in a hate for the ungodly ways. Not the ungodly, but the ways. Big difference, amen? amen. We've got to make sure we manage that well, because there's a lot of places that would say, and I've seen, like, I don't know what they're reading, but they hate the ungodly. It's the complete opposite. One of the guys, I, I saw a sermon, he's like, um, I don't care that the Word tells me I'm going to love my enemies. I hate my enemies, and I, I want them to die and go to hell, the pastor preached, screamed, and was pointing at his congregation. He says, I hate every false way, 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 way. And so this is a good litmus test, I think. I think these, these verses here, these three verses, 20, 126, 120, 120, 127, 128, is a good litmus test for us. What do I love? What do I hate? Authentically. What do I love? What do I hate? Do I love and desire the Word like the psalmist does above fine gold? Do I hate every false way like the psalmist does? Or am I just in that false way and loving it? Taking a bath in it? Playing around in it? I think it's a good litmus test. So what we find in these verses, and we'll read them here in a minute, uh, verses 113 through 120, um, God's Word opposes the wicked. And then in 121 through 128, God's Word creates godliness. Let's read it one more time. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your Word. You are my hiding place, not the rickety shed like Twister. My own works, my own efforts are the things of the world. They get blown over, but you are my hiding place. I hope in your Word. Depart from me, you evildoers that I may keep the commandments of my God. Notice the evildoer's presence. He wants them to leave so that he can keep the commandments because he knows that the presence of the evildoers because of his own flesh will bring and lead him into that ungodliness. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Uphold me according to your promise that I may live and let me not be put to shame in my hope. Hold me up that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. You spurn all who go astray from your statutes, for their cunning is in vain. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross, scooping them up, and at judgment day will throw them into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth, like dross. Therefore I love your testimonies. My flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. 121, I have done what is just and right. Do not leave me to my oppressors. Give your servant a pledge of good. Not, let not the insolent oppress me. My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Deal with your servant according to your steadfast love and teach me your statutes. I am your servant. Give me understanding that I may know your testimonies. It is time for the Lord to act. For your law has been broken, therefore I love your commandments above gold, above fine gold. Therefore I consider all your precepts to be right. I hate every false way. Meaty. Let's pray. Lord, we, <laughs> man, I love this psalm. Jesus, Lord, I pray that you continue to use your word to reach down into the depths of our hearts, our souls, into those areas that we have kind of protected away from you. And to um, overwhelm us with truth to cause us to bend our knee in complete and total submission, giving everything over to you. Um, all 100%. Lord, I, um, I pray that, um, that we can profess, like the psalmist professed, that I have done what is just and right, and that our conscience is clear throughout this ministry, because we're living our lives for an audience of one. Um, you see what is done in the darkness. So, Lord, I pray that everybody in this room and the rest of the staff that's not here 
um, that we all come with bended knee saying to you, I am your servant with a desire for you to be glorified more and more um, through us individually and through us corporately as a, uh, as a ministry here. Lord, save sinners through this mission by the proclaiming of your gospel. We love and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.